Radiographic grids. This is part two of chapter 12 from the Johnston and Faber book, Essentials of Radiographic Physics and Imaging. The radiographic grid was invented in 1913 by Gustav Bucky and continues to be the most effective means for limiting the amount of scatter radiation that reaches the IR. Grids are approximately a quarter inch thick and they can range from 8 by 10 to 17 by 17, just depending on the size of the IR with the machine that you are using. The grid is a device that has very thin lead strips with radiolucent interspaces. It is intended to absorb scatter radiation emitted by the patient before it reaches the IR. It's placed between the patient and the IR <clears throat> and grids are an invaluable in the practice of radiography. They work well to improve radiographic contrast because they do filter out and absorb the scatter radiation that comes from the patient before it reaches the IR. They do work well to improve radiographic contrast, but there are some drawbacks. Because of this, we have to increase our mass by use, with the, using a grid, and because we are increasing our mass, that will result in a higher patient dose of radiation. Grids are typically only used when the anatomic part is 10 centimeters or more, which is also four inches or more in thickness. And we can also use grids for imaging procedures requiring more than 60 kVp. Grids contain thin lead strips or lines that have a precise height, thickness, and space between them. Radiolucent interspace material is going to separate the lead lines. The interspace material typically is made of aluminum. An aluminum front and back panel cover the lead lines and interspace material of the grid. Grid construction can be described by grid frequency and grid ratio. Grid frequency expresses the number of lead lines per unit length in inches, centimeters, or both. Grid frequencies can range in a value of 25 to 45 lines per centimeter, or 60 to 110 lines per inch. A typical value for grid frequency might be 40 lines divided by a centimeter, or 103 lines divided by inches. Another way of describing grid construction by its grid ratio. So the grid ratio is defined as the right ratio of the height of the lead strips to the distance between them. So grid ratio is the height divided by the width of the inner space. In the formula, grid ratio equals H divided by D. The H is the height of the lead strips, and D is the distance between them, or the width of the inner space. Grid ratio ranges from 4 to 1 to 16 to 1. High ratio grids remove or clean up more scatter radiation than lower ratio grids and further increase the radiographic contrast. As grid ratio increases for the same grid frequency, scatter cleanup improves and radiographic contrast increases. As grid ratio decreases for the same grid frequency, scatter cleanup is less effective and radiographic contrast decreases. Grid pattern refers to the linear pattern of the lead lines of a grid. There are two types of grid patterns, linear and crossed or cross-hatched. The top one here is the linear and the bottom one is the cross-hatched or the crossed. A linear grid has lead lines that run in only one direction. Linear grids are the most popular in terms of grid pattern because they allow angulation of the x-ray tube along the length of the lead lines. A cross grid or a cross hatched grid has lead lines that run at right angles to one another. 
Crossed grids remove more scattered photons than the linear grids because they contain more lead strips that are oriented in two directions instead of just one that the, the linear has. Applications are limited with a crossed grid because the x-ray tube cannot be angled in any direction without producing grid cutoff, which is absorption of the transmitted x-rays. Grid cutoff, which is undesirable, is going to be discussed later on in this chapter, so we'll discuss it at the end. Grid focus refers to the orientation of the lead lines to one another. There are two types of grid focus that exist. There is the parallel, non-focused, and the focused. A parallel grid or non-focused grid has lead lines that run parallel to one another. And you can see that in the top figure here. Parallel grids are used primarily in fluoroscopy and mobile imaging. A focused grid has lead lines that are angled or canted to approximately match the angle of divergence of the primary beam. So that'll be figure 1216, which is the bottom one here. You can see how the lines are angled. The advantage of focused grids compared with parallel grids is that focused grids allow more transmitted photons to reach the IR. As seen in this picture here, transmitted photons are more likely to pass through a focused grid to reach the IR than they are to pass through a parallel grid. Focus grids have lead lines that are angled to approximately match the divergence, divergence of the primary beam. Therefore, focus grids allow more transmitted photons to reach the IR than parallel grids. As seen in this picture, if imaginary lines were drawn from each of the lead lines in a linear focused grid, these lines would meet to form an imaginary point, which you can see on both ends here, called the convergent point. The line that goes from point to point is called the convergent line. Both the convergent line and convergent points are important because they determine the focal distance of the focused grid. The focal distance, sometimes referred to as the grid radius, is the distance between the grid and the convergent line or point. The focal distance is important because it's used to determine the focal range of a focused grid. The focal range is the recommended range of SIDs that can be used with a focused grid. The convergent line or point always falls within this focal range. For example, a common focal range is 36 to 42 inches with a focal distance of 40 inches. And then another common focal range is 66 to 74 inches with a focal distance of 72 inches. And that's why we use 40 inches and 72 inches are the most common SIDs that we use. Because the lead lines in a parallel grid are not angled, they have a focal range extending from a minimum SID to infinity. And beyond! Grids are available for use by the radiographer in several forms, and they can be stationary or moving. Stationary non-moving grids include the wafer or the slip-on grid, the grid cassette, and the grid cap. A wafer grid matches the size of the cassette and is used by placing it on top of the IR. Wafer grids typically are taped to the IR to prevent them from sliding during the procedure. A grid cassette is an IR that has a grid permanently mounted to its front surface. And then the grid cap contains a permanently mounted grid and allows the IR to slide in behind it or it snaps on the front of the IR. Many IRs can be interchanged behind the grid before processing the image. When grids are stationary, it's possible to closely examine and see the grid lines on the radiographic image. 
Slightly moving the grid during the x-ray exposure blurs the grid lines. Moving or reciproc reciprocating grids are part of the Bucky, more accurately called the Potter-Bucky diaphragm. The grid is located directly below the radiographic tabletop and just above the tray that holds the IR. Grid motion is controlled electrically by the x-ray exposure switch. The grid will move slightly back and forth in a lateral direction over the IR during the entire exposure to blur the lines. These grids usually are about 17 by 17 or 14 by 17 and can be positioned under the grid either lengthwise or crosswise depending on the examination requirements. Linear grids can be either constructed as a long dimension or a short dimension. A long dimension linear grid has lead strips running parallel to the long axis of the grid. And then a short dimension linear grid has lead strips running perpendicular to the long axis of the grid. For example, um, in the pictures here, you can see a short dimension and a long dimension. So for a 14 by 17 dimension grid has lead strips 17 inches long, whereas a short dimension grid has lead strips 14 inches long. A short dimension grid may be useful for examinations in which it's difficult to center the CR correctly for the long dimension grid. So a short dimension is more forgiving. The purpose of using grids and radiography is to increase our radiographic contrast. In addition um, to improving the contrast by cleaning up the scatter, grids reduce the total amount of x-rays reaching the IR. The better the grid at absorbing scattered photons, such as with a higher um, ratio grid, the fewer the photons reaching the IR. So to compensate for this reduction, additional mass must be used to produce diagnostic images. So we use the grid conversion factor or the Bucky factor to determine the adjustment in mass needed when changing from using a grid to non-grid or vice versa, or for changing to grids with different grid ratios. As grid ratio increases, radiation exposure to the IR decreases. As grid ratio decreases, radiation exposure to the IR increases. So we can look at the GCF, which is the grid conversion factor or the Bucky factor. And the GCF is given to us when we divide mass with the grid divided by mass without the grid. When we want to change from one grid ratio to another, we're going to use this formula here. And this is mass 1 divided by mass 2 equals the grid conversion factor 1 divided by the grid conversion factor 2. So for this equation to work, you must know the grid conversion Bucky factors. And they are without a grid, so no grid, the GCF is 1. 5 to 1, GCF is 2. 6 to 1, GCF is 3. 8 to 1, GCF is 4. 12 to 1, GCF is 5. 16 to 1, your GCF is 6. So in addition to the disadvantage of increased patient dose associated with the grid use, there is another disadvantage is the possibility of grid cutoff. So grid cutoff is defined as a decrease in the number of transmitted photons that reach the IR because of some misalignment of the grid. So the primary radiographic effect of grid cutoff is a further reduction in the number of photons reaching the IR. This is going to result in an increase in noise caused by a decrease in the X-ray photons reaching the IR. Grid cutoff may require that the radiographer repeats the image, thereby increasing patient dose again. Grid ratio has a significant effect on grid cutoff, with higher grid ratios resulting in more potential cutoff. Grid cutoff can occur because of four types of errors. 
To reduce or eliminate grid cutoff, the radiographer must have a thorough understanding of the importance of proper grid alignment in relation to the IR and the x-ray tube. There are the four types. There's upside down focused grid, off level grid, off center grid, and off focus grid. Upside down focused cutoff occurs when a focus grid is placed upside down on the IR, resulting in grid lines going opposite of the angle of divergence of the x-ray beam. So this appears radiographically as a lot of loss of exposure along the edges of the image. Photons will easily pass through the center of the grid because the lead lines are perpendicular to the IR surface. Lead lines that are more peripheral to the center are angled more and therefore transmitting photons. Upside down focus grid error is easily avoided because every focus grid should have label indicating tube side. The side of the grid should always face the tube away from the IR. Off level grid cutoff results when the x-ray beam is angled across the lead strips. It is the most common type of cutoff and can occur from either the tube or the grid being angled. Off level grid cutoff can often be seen with mobile radiography or horizontal beam exams and appears as a loss of exposure across the entire IR. This type of grid cutoff is the only type that occurs with both focused and parallel grids. So you can see the picture to the left is showing the proper position of the tube and the IR. And then the picture to the right is showing that the tube is coming down perpendicular, but the grid is off level. So the tube does not match the angle of the grid and therefore is off level. Off centering or also called lateral decentering is an off centered grid cutoff and then occurs when the CR of the x-ray beam is not aligned from side to side with the center of a focused grid. Because of the arrangement of the lead lines of the focused grid, the di divergence of the primary beam does not match the angle of these lead strips when centered or when not centered. Um, off center grid cutoff appears radiographically as an overall loss of exposure and you can see that in the image here. So if you look at the tube on the left, it'll show proper positioning. You can see the beam coming down and hitting the IR and the grid. <clears throat> it has perfect positioning because it's in the center. The one to the right is a little bit over to the left, so it's off center and it creates this horrible image. The off focus grid cutoff occurs when using an SID outside of the recommended focal range. The grid cutoff occurs if the SID is less than or greater than the focal range. Radiographically, both appear the same. It shows a loss of exposure at the periphery of the image. A radiographic image that is underexposed can be the result of many factors, and one of which is the grid cutoff. Before assuming that an underexposed image is due to the insufficient mass and then re-exposing the patient with the mass increase, you should always evaluate grid alignment first. So if it is misaligned, it could be the cause of the underexposure. The patient can be protected from having to repeat the image with increased mass. It's always important to note that the brightness of a digital image will be computer adjusted for reduction in exposure to the IR because of grid errors. However, increased quantum noise may be visible and image quality could be reduced because of it. The Moray effect or zebra pattern is an artifact that can occur when a stationary grid is used during CR imaging if the grid frequency is similar to the laser scanning frequency during the CR image um, with the processing, then a zebra pattern can result on the digital image. Use of a higher grid frequency or a moving grid with CR digital imaging eliminates this type of error. In addition, if a grid cassette is placed in the Bucky, imaging the double grids creates a zebra pattern on the radiograph.
The radiographer must consider several factors when deciding which type of grid, if any, to use for an exam. Although quite efficient at preventing scatter radiation from reaching the IR, grids are not appropriate for all exams. When appropriate, selection of a grid involves consideration of a contrast improvement, patient dose, and then the likelihood of grid cutoff. Radiographers typically choose between parallel and focused grids, high and low ratio, grids with different focal ranges, and then whether to use a grid at all. Limiting the size of the x-ray field to the anatomic area of interest will decrease scatter production and re reduce patient exposure. Although the mass may be increased to compensate for decreasing the size of the field, the tissues located closest to the lateral edge or outside of the collimated x-ray beam will receive the least amount of radiation exposure. Those tissues that lie inside the collimated edge of the x-ray beam will receive the greatest amount of radiation exposure, and collimating to that anatomic area of interest is an important radiation safety practice that should be routinely performed. The use of grids requires an increase in mass to maintain the exposure to the image receptor, but as a result, patient radiation exposure is increased when using grids. So it's kind of like risk versus the benefit effect. The higher the grid ratio, the greater the mass needed to maintain exposure to the image receptor, and this is going to increase your patient's exposure. Limiting the use of grids or using a grid with a lower grid ratio will decrease the radiation exposure to your patient. The air gap technique. Um, you may use the grid most often to prevent scatter from reaching the IR, but the grid is not the only available tool. Although limited in its usefulness, the air gap technique provides another method for limiting the scatter reaching the IR. So the air gap technique is based on the simple concept that much of the scatter will miss the IR if there is increased distance between the patient and the IR. So increased object to image receptor distance, which is OID. The greater the gap, the greater the reduction in scatter reaching the IR. Similar to a grid, contrast is increased. The number of photons reaching the IR is reduced because there's less scatter reaching the IR, and the mass is increased to compensate. The air gap technique is limited in its usefulness because the necessary OID results in decreased sharpness. So to overcome this the decrease in sharpness, an increase in SID is required, which may not always be feasible. The air gap technique results in patient dose that is the same as or slightly less than using a comparable grid. Exposure may be slightly less because a grid absorbs some of the photons, which is the grid cutoff, and the air gap technique does not. The air gap technique is an alternative to using a grid to control scattering reach, scatter reaching the IR. By moving the IR away from the patient, more of the scatter radiation misses the IR. The greater the gap, the less scatter that reaches the IR. Using an increased OID is necessary for the air gap technique. However, this does decrease image quality. So decrease to decrease unsharpness and increase spatial resolution, the radiographer must increase SID. So if you have a large OID, then you have to increase your SID. There are tons of shielding accessories available to the RT. Placing a lead shield on the x-ray table absorbs scatter radiation. So we'll use this a lot when we're doing lumbar spines. Um, any individual in the radiographic room during an exposure must wear a lead apron. So if you have a mom and a child and you're x-raying the child, you want to make sure that mom has a lead apron on or have them stand behind behind the lead window with you by the control panel. Because the patient is the greatest source of scatter radiation, any individual remaining in the radiographic room during an exposure must wear a lead apron. So that's why 
Um, wearing a lead apron and standing as far from the patient as possible is going to decrease the amount of exposure to scatter radiation. So we want to make sure that we are standing at least six feet away from the primary beam.